الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين لعن الله الظالمين لكم من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما محمد إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل أفإما تأو قتلا قلبتم على أعقابكم ومن ينقلب على عقبيه فلن يضر الله شيئا وسيجزي الله الشاكرين Refreshing your gatherings with the remembrance of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Another salawat for the love of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. And a third salawat for the love and the hastening of the reappearance of the Imam of our time, Imam al Hujjah, Ajalallah ta'ala, Farajah al Sharif. As we gather to commemorate the martyrdom of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, we are reminded of the split that took place immediately after the departure of Rasulullah from this life and the usurpation of the Khilafah from Amir al Mu'mineen and the changing of the course that Allah and Rasulullah had planned for this Ummah. This was a deliberate action that took place immediately after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when the Prophet was not even buried yet. You see that there was an inqilab and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this in the Quran. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلِ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلْ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ If he dies or he's killed, will you turn back over your heels? And we see that history is proof that such action did take place and there was a derailment of the Ummah which had many consequences. And we are living until today, we are experiencing and we are seeing the consequences of the actions of a handful of individuals 14 centuries ago. The murder of Imam al-Hussein was one of those consequences. The killing that you see today was one of, is one of those consequences. The division, the weakness of Islam and the Muslims today, where Muslims have become a mockery in the world, this is as a result of that split that took place. <laughs> and today we are gathered to commemorate the Fatimiyyah because Fatima al-Zahra was the first victim of that division that took place. Fatima al-Zahra was the first victim of that assertion of the Khilafah and she was the first defender of Imamah. Today we hear many people that are killed for the sake of the Imamah, for the sake of being Shia. They ask them, What's, who's your Imam? If this person says, I follow Ali ibn Abi Talib, right away he's killed. Well, you know who was the first victim? It was Fatima al-Zahra And this is why as a Shi'i, as a follower of the Ahlul Bayt, I have to always go back to Fatima. Because Fatima is the core. Fatima is the essence. If you cry for Imam al-Hussein and you refuse to accept and acknowledge the oppression that took place against Fatima, then the crying for Imam al-Hussein is not going to help you. Because it was 
the attack on Fatima that led to the attack on Imam Hussein. It was the crushed rib of Fatima, the broken rib of Fatima that led to the broken ribs of Abu Abdullah. It was the loss of Muhsin, the son of Fatima, that led to the butcher of Ali al-Azhar in Karbala. So this is why we need to acknowledge the events that took place in history. And we should not be shy of stating the truth. Some people get very uncomfortable. Some people say, you know what, this is a topic that we should not talk about. This is something that we should put aside because it will, it will open the wounds. Well, since when did seeking justice just because it opens wounds, should it be delayed? Should we delay seeking justice just because of a few people, their emotions are going to be hurt? This is one. Second, if it was your mother, if it was your family member, would you say, yeah, let's just leave it, let's just not talk about it? Or is it just because it's Fatima and the family of Rasulullah that many people say, you know what, let's just not talk about this? There are people that get uncomfortable when we commemorate Ashura, when we commemorate the, the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. Just because people get uncomfortable, we have to state the truth. And third, these events, the murder of Fatima, the martyrdom of Fatima to Zahra, and the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, and these historical events that have been recorded by those who wrote history, and those who wrote history were never Shia. Those who wrote history, history is always written by those who are in power. These consequential events, there's a lot of, there's a lot that is to be held. There's a lot that we have to come and see what happened in history. Today, Muslims, they want to know which path should they take. Should I take the path of the oppressor or should I be on the path of the one who is oppressed? This is why we commemorate Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. And then for those who say that commemorating the martyrdom of Fatima Zahra is a cause of division, no. For 14 centuries, we have seen the narrative that has been told by those who were against Fatima Zahra and against the Ahlul Bayt. Has that brought us unity? Let us go back and see the narrative, the viewpoint of the Ahlul Bayt salam. Because it is only through the Ahlul Bayt that true unity will be able to be achieved. And this is what Fatima said in her khutbah in the Masjid of Rasulullah. She says, وَجَعَلَ اللَّهِ طَاعَتَنَا نِظَامًا لِلْمِلَّهِ وَإِمَامَتَنَا أَمَانًا مِنَ الْفِرْقَةِ in that long speech that she gave in the Masjid of Rasulullah, she said, and Allah made our ta'ah, the obedience of the Ahlul Bayt, the family that Allah purified and chose in the Qur'an and ordered us to show mawadda to. She says, Allah made our ta'ah nidhaman lil millah. It will organize the millah. And wa imamatana amanan min al firqah. And our imamah, when you follow the Ahlul Bayt, that is the only way that you will stay away from division. That is the only way that you will be able to achieve true unity. So this is why we commemorate Fatima. And then we have to ask questions. Shouldn't we, don't we have the right to ask, why is it that Fatima Zahra died and left this life? According to narrations, one hadith says 40 days after Rasulullah. Another hadith says 70 days. Another one says 90 days after the Prophet. Why? Fatima was 18 years old. According to the Shia tradition, according to the Sunni tradition, which says that she was born five years before the Bi'tha, that means she is 20, 28 years old. Anyways, 18 or 28, why would an 18 or 28 who is perfectly healthy die all of a sudden? And then why would she order and ask in her will, why would she ask Amir al-Mu'mineen to bury her in the middle of the night? Why did she ask for those who oppressed her to not participate in her funeral? These are all questions that we have to ask. Is Fatima a nobody? Fatima, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says in a hadith that is mentioned in Bukhari, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْضَى لِرِضَى فَاطِمَةٌ وَيَغْضَبُ لِغَضَبِهَا Allah is satisfied by the satisfaction of Fatima. Yes, a woman. Allah is satisfied by the satisfaction of Fatima and Allah is angered by the anger of Fatima. And the same Bukhari, the same narrator, he says, مَاتَتْ فَاطِمَةٌ وَهِيَ وَاجِدَ عَلَىٰ أَبِي بَكْرِ Fatima died while she was angry with Abu Bakr. And others, they say she was angry with the Shaykhain, the two men. This is narrated, this is all in our history. You don't need to go and look very far. It's all there. But there are some that refuse to look at history and refuse to acknowledge history. We need to look, my dear brothers and sisters. We need to look and we need to acknowledge the events of history. 
What happened that led to the martyrdom of Fatima Zahra? What were the events in history that took place? How is it that Fatima, the only remaining daughter of the Prophet, has to be buried less than 60 days, 70 days, 90 days after the death of Rasulullah? What happened? Shouldn't we ask? Don't we have the right to ask? There were events in history that took place and we have to remember them. We have to look into them. And anyone with a good conscience should look into this, look into this reality. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, when they remember their mother Fatima, the Imam in the Ziyarah of Fatima to Zahra, he says, As-salamu alayki ayyatuha siddiqatu shahida The Imam, he says, peace be upon you, O siddiqah, the truthful one, O shahida. She is a martyr. In the Ziyarah, and inshallah, Allah grants us all the Ziyarah of Fatima to Zahra. In Medina, the Imams say, As-salamu alayki ayyatuha al-mazlumatu al-makhsubah. Peace be upon you, O one who was oppressed. And her haqq was taken away from her. As-salamu alayki ayyatuha al-muftahadatu al-makhura. Peace be upon you, O one who was oppressed, neglected by the ummah. The ummah of Rasulullah, he left one daughter. One daughter he left. And you see how she was treated. Where Fatima al-Zahra left this life very soon after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa What happened? What were the events in history that led to her martyrdom? Now, of course, when we say Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is a martyr, this doesn't mean that someone came and killed her the way Imam al-Hussein was killed on the day of Ashura. But there were events in history that took place and there was an attack on the house of Fatima which led for her to be injured. And that injury in which she sustained, it cost for her to leave this life very early. This is what we mean. Otherwise, why would a perfectly healthy lady, 18 years old, leave this life at such a young age? There are many clues. There are many signs, my dear brothers and sisters. And these signs, they're not mentioned in the Shia books. What were the events? How did it escalate? What happened that led to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam being killed? It all began before the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, where 70 days before the death of Rasulullah, what took place? It was the day of Ghadir. Rasulullah in Ghadir after Hajjat al-Wada' He made all of the Muslims give allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen, give allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib. It wasn't just a day where he said, Man kuntu mawlah fahada aliyun mawlah. It was a day where they gave bay'ah to Amir al-Mu'mineen. And they came to him, the first and the second. They come to him and they tell him, Bakhil, bakhil, laka ya Ali, asbahta mawlai wa mawla kulli mu'minin wa mu'mina. Congratulations, O Ali. You are my mawla and you are the mawla of every man and woman. But then you see, that there was a change. And this was a change that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala foretold in the Quran. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ أَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلِ أَفَإِنْ مَا تَوْقُتِلْ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ This was the Quran telling the future what will happen. Telling what's in the hearts of certain individuals. And yes, there were certain individuals who did not want to see the way of Rasulullah go forward. There were some men from Quraysh who were filled with hatred towards Rasulullah and towards Amir al-Mu'mineen, especially because it was Amir al-Mu'mineen who was responsible in the battle for killing half of the mushrikeen. Go and look at what he did in the battle of Badr, in the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Hunayn, in the battle of Khandaq. It was Amir al-Mu'mineen. So there was a hatred for Amir, for Amir al-Mu'mineen. And this was a hatred that was public. During the time of Muawiyah, for Bani Umayyah, they started the cursing of Amir al-Mu'mineen, which lasted for over 80 years. This is recorded. This is recorded in history. They used to go up and give a khutbah on the Friday prayer. A part of the khutbah was to curse Amir al-Mu'mineen. But that hatred has started much before than the Bani Umayyah. There were men and there were individuals from Quraysh that had conspired to keep Amir al-Mu'mineen out of power, to keep the Khilafah away from Amir al-Mu'mineen. And it was between Ghadir and between the death of Rasulullah where there was a plan that was taking place. There was a plan that was taking place. Several men from Quraysh, they could not see Amir al-Mu'mineen lead. 
And this is why later, many years later, Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of Rasulullah, he asks Umar ibn al-Khattab, he tells him, مَا مَنَعَكُمْ أَن تَخْتَارُونَ Ali? What kept you from being with Ali ibn Abi Talib, from accepting Ali ibn Abi Talib? What was wrong with Ali ibn Abi Talib? He tells him very clearly. He tells him, لَقَدْ كَرِهَتْ قُرَيْشْ أَن تَجْتَمِعَ النُّبُوَّةَ وَالْخِلَافَةَ فِي بَنِي هَاشِمْ فَيَتَكَبَّرُونَ بِهَا عَلَى سَائِرِ قُرَيْشْ He says, Quraysh did not want the prophethood and the khilafah to be with Bani Hashim, so then they were going to be arrogant over the other Quraysh. What does this show? This shows that Allah has a plan, but some individuals of Quraysh, they have another plan. They saw that they can't fight Rasulullah. Rasulullah, towards the end of his life, people were entering the religion in flocks. يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا And in a tribal society, if they see that this tribe and this tribe and this tribe and this tribe, they all submitted. Of course, one tribe is also going to, because they make alliances with one another. So they submit. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to cause sabotage later on. And this is what the Quran warned about, about the hypocrites, about the munafiqeen. And there were individuals, Allah tells Rasulullah, there are individuals from Medina, min ahlil madinati maradu alam nifaq. They are so good at hypocrisy that no one could tell. But the events after the death of Rasulullah made it clear who was the munafiq and who was the mu'min. Days before the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there was a... Rasulullah had ordered for the Muslims to go out and mobilize for war under the leadership of a man by the name of Usama ibn Zayd. Zayd was the man who was the adopted son of the Prophet. He was killed in the battle of Mu'tah. He has a son, a young son by the name of Zayd. Now the Muslims are preparing for battle with the Romans because the Islamic Empire is growing and the Muslims are getting ready because the Romans are going to attack at any minute. So he tells them, everyone, and this was days, this was a week before the death of the Prophet. He tells them, every man in Medina, other than the ones who he ordered to stay with him, every man should join the army of Zayd. Every man should join the army of Usama. Rasulullah kept ordering, join the army of Usama, join the army of Usama, nafidu jaysha Usama. There were some, they saw Rasulullah is dying. And Rasulullah had a strategy, he wanted them to leave Medina, so that when he passes away, he passes away and the pass of power, the transfer of power goes to Amir al-Mu'mineen at peace. And there's those individuals who he doubted in, those individuals are not going to be in Medina. So Rasulullah keeps saying, nafidu jaysha Usama, but these individuals, they keep coming back. There were certain men that kept coming back until Rasulullah, and this is narrated by a Sunni scholar by the name of ash in his book Al-Milal wa nahal and other books. Rasulullah says, نَفِّذُوا جَيْشَ Usama, لَعَنَ اللَّهِ مَنْ تَخَلَّفَ عَنْ جَيْشَ Usama. He says, go and join the army of Usama. May the curse of Allah be upon the one who does not join the army of Usama. Now, Usama was a young man. Why did Rasulullah choose a young man? Why didn't he choose one of the older men? So that later on, no one could come and say, Oh, Ali is too young. He made the big heads of Quraysh go and be under the leadership of Usama. This was the order of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But of course, some, several of them, they kept coming back. They would keep coming back and they're waiting, when is Rasulullah going to pass away? Now, the next event that comes in history is an event that is referred to as the calamity of Thursday, Raziyat al Khamis. And this is also referred to by Bukhari. Rasulullah, this is on Thursday, Rasulullah passes away on a Monday. So, four days before the death of Rasulullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he tells his companions, there are several men gathered around the deathbed of Rasulullah, and Rasulullah he tells them, Etuni bidawatin wa katif. لأكتب لكم ما لا تظلوا بعده أبدا أو لن تظلوا بعده أبدا. He says, bring me a writing tool, دواتن وكتف and a shoulder, because a shoulder of an animal, of a lamb, of a goat, of a sheep, it has a flat, a flat bone, a shoulder bone. He says, إتوني بدواتن وكتف لأكتب لكم so that I write to you and I tell you to write something that you will never go astray. لن تظلوا بعده أبدا. Now what happens? They start fighting while Rasulullah is laying. 
They start fighting with one another. Some say, give him. Others say, don't, until one of them. Some narrations, they mention his name. Others, they try to take his name out. But it's obvious who it was. It was Umar ibn al-Khattab. He says, يَكْفِينَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَيَهْجُرُ He says, the book of Allah is enough. The man is hallucinating. لا إله إلا الله. The man, this is the Prophet used to pray behind. This is the Prophet that guided you. Now he, he, all of a sudden he became the man in the Rajul. And then, doesn't Allah say, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولِ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَعَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Except what the Prophet says. Doesn't Allah say, إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمْ If you love Allah, then follow everything that the Prophet says. Doesn't Allah say, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى Anything that the Prophet says, it's a revelation from Allah. So now all of a sudden, the man is hallucinating. Then they start fighting with one another. And then Rasulullah tells them, leave me. There should be no fighting next to a prophet. And they left. And it was not written. Now someone could ask, why didn't Rasulullah just go ahead and say what he wanted to say? What did Rasulullah want to say? It's obvious. Rasulullah wanted to tell them that Ali ibn Abi Talib is after me. And they did not want Rasulullah to say his will. Imagine Rasulullah, how oppressed he is when Rasulullah says, ma mithla ma No prophet has been abused and harassed the way I have been. This is the meaning of it. This is the meaning of it. The prophet, when he was hurt by the kuffar and the mushrikeen, he tolerated that. But it's the pain that was taken, the oppression that came from the ummah that hurts the prophet the most. Because after all, it was the ummah, the Muslims, that killed Imam al Hussein. It was the ummah that turned against the family of the Prophet and Fatima al Zahra. So, Rasulullah, of course, if he would have, some would have said, some would say, why didn't he just go ahead and tell them? After they've accused him of hallucinating, who's going to accept the wasiyah of a man who's accused of hallucinating? So, Rasulullah, he kicked them out. Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he comes out of the room crying. And he says, Al-Raziyyah, kullu al-Raziyyah, ma hala bayna rasulillahi wa kitabah. He says, the calamity, all of the calamity is the one who caused, Rasul, stopped Rasulullah from writing his kitab. This is our problem. Today we Muslims, we just want to see Rasulullah. What did Rasulullah want to tell us? If he would have been able to say, this would have stopped all of the oppression. But there were individuals that did not want Rasulullah to say his own will, to say his own wasiyah. This was the calamity of Thursday. And then you go four days later, the 28th of Safar, in the year 11 after Hijrah, year 632 CE. That was the saddest day in the history of humanity. That was the day that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi left this life. That was the day where the wahi, the revelation was disconnected. And that was the day that the mercy was disconnected. Because Rasulullah, his essence was a mercy. As long as he was there, there was a unity. He kept them united. But as soon as he was gone, you see from the first moment, the sparks of division, they began. And it began immediately after the death of the Prophet. Historians mention that Rasulullah had just passed away. The Muslims, they began to cry. The Muslims in the masjid, they begin sobbing and crying. Except one person, he makes a scene in the masjid of the Prophet. He comes and he starts saying, Rasulullah did not die. And whoever says Muhammad died, this person will be hit and will be abused. This was Umar ibn al-Khattab. He says, Rasulullah, Muhammad did not die. He was raised like Jesus was raised. He did not want anyone to acknowledge the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Then a while later, Abu Bakr, he comes, he had a village, he had a farm outside of Medina. A while later, Abu Bakr comes, then he goes and he looks at the Prophet. Then he comes out and he says, if anyone was worshipping Muhammad, then know that Muhammad died, but know that the Lord of Muhammad is alive. And then suddenly, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says, yes, Muhammad died. Rasulullah passed away. Now, historians, when they've come and they've analyzed this, they say there's a reason behind this. Because it shows that everything 
that took place was premeditated. There were many events that took place in history that were premeditated. And you will come to discover this once you see the whole history. Once you see the whole story like a movie playing in front of you, you will see that there were certain events that took place. Now why would he come and say Rasulullah did not die? die? First, to wait for Abu Bakr to come. To wait for Abu Bakr to be there in the presence of Abu Bakr to say that. And second, so that no one talks about the leadership after Rasulullah until Abu Bakr comes. So no one talks about who's going to be the leader after Rasulullah. Because when you say Rasulullah died, then that means you're going to have to go to the next leader. But if you delay the announcement and say, I'm going to hit anyone who says Rasulullah died, what does that mean? That means that we're going to delay this conversation. We're not going to talk about the leadership after Rasulullah until we decide when we talk about it. So... This is an event that took place. And simultaneously, in Medina, in the outskirts of Medina, in the Saqifa. A Saqifa, which was a covering, a covering, a shade basically. And this was the headquarters of the people of Medina, the Ansar, the Aws and the Khazraj. This was their headquarters before Islam. This was the place of decision making. So now, Rasulullah is passing away. And the Aws and the Khazraj, the Ansar, those who welcome the hosts of the Muslims in Medina, they notice that things are not going the way Rasulullah planned. They notice that there is a change that's taking place. And there might be an inqilab. There might be a revolt, a rebellion that's going on. So the people of Medina, the Aws and the Khazraj, they decide to gather in the Saqifa for what? To say that, listen, we all want Ali ibn Abi Talib. And we all gave bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib. But if something happens and Ali ibn Abi Talib ends up not becoming the leader, then we are the ones who deserve to choose because we are the hosts. We are the ones who invited the muhajirin. So if the, if the will of Rasulullah has not taken place, then at least we are the ones who should choose who is the leader. So they gather and the head of that gathering was a man, the head of the Khazraj tribe by the name of Sa'd ibn Ubadah. He was a well-respected figure and his view was that Amir al-Mu'mineen should be the leader. And the view of most of the Ansar was that Amir al-Mu'mineen should be the leader. But they were talking for plan B. What should they do if there's a coup? If Amir al-Mu'mineen is not allowed to lead? Now, this event is taking place. Two men from the Ansar, they go and they inform Abu Bakr, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah. They go and they tell these three men that there's a gathering taking place in the Saqifah. Now you would imagine the companion of the Prophet, the one who is supposedly the, the closest to the Prophet, would not leave the Prophet, right? These three men, they left the Prophet. The one who was saying Rasulullah is not dead and I'm going to hit anyone who says Rasulullah died. Suddenly he left the Prophet. And the other two, they leave the Prophet and they go to the Saqifah. They see the gathering between the Khazraj and the Aws. They're gathering and they're discussing the leadership after the Prophet. So Abu Bakr begins and he tells them, listen, if we're going to be talking about a leadership after the Prophet, we are the Muhajireen. We are the ones who first believed in the Prophet. We are the ones who first accepted the Prophet. We are the ones who migrated and left our land, Mecca, with the Prophet. Therefore, we are entitled and we are deserving of the Khilafah. And you, the Ansar, you accepted and you welcomed and you are the Wazir and we are the leader. We are the Amir and you are the Wazir. Minna Amir wa minkum Wazir. Now, the Ansar, they began to argue and there was a heated debate between the Ansar and the Muhajireen and several other men from the Muhajireen, such as Khalid ibn al-Walid and others, they came and they joined this gathering in the Saqifah. Now, there was a very heated debate that was taking place until a man by the name of Al-Habbab ibn al-Mundhir, he comes, he's from the Ansar, he says, no, you're not going to take the Khilafah, you're not going to take the leader, we are the Ansar, we are the ones that fought in all of the battles of the Prophet, we are the ones that sacrificed, we are the ones that hosted and we gave. Suddenly, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he goes and he hits Al-Habbab ibn al-Mundhir. He hits him, that man has a bloody nose, then Abu Bakr, there's a chaos that's taking place. Abu Bakr says, I have a suggestion. I nominate either Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah or Umar ibn al-Khattab to be the leaders. Then Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah, he says, I won't take it. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says, how can I take the leadership when you, Abu Bakr, are older than me? Give me your hands and I will give you bay'ah. He gives his hands and he gives him bay'ah. 
Then several of the Muhajireen and several of the Ansar, they come and they give bay'ah to Abu Bakr. Why did some of the Ansar give bay'ah to Abu Bakr? Because there was an old division and dispute between the Ansar, the Aus and the Khazraj. So several men from the Aus tribe, they came and they gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. And those were Ma'ad ibn Jabal, Zayd ibn Thabit, and Bashir ibn Sa'd and several others. But the majority of the Ansar, they did not give bay'ah. And Sa'd ibn Ubadah, he was also beat. And he was an old, respectable man from the Ansar. He was beat up. While he was beat up, some men were giving bay'ah to Abu Bakr. And this is the Sabifa. This is the shura that some Muslims talk about today. Today when we read some books, they say yes, the Sunnis, they accepted a shura, a council, and the Shias, they went after the family of the Prophet. Making it seem as if the Shias are just following the family blindly, and as if the shura was a real shura that took place. As if it was a real council that took place. Is this a real shura? Where some men are getting beat up, Ali ibn Abi Talib and all of Bani Hashim are in the house of the Prophet, and many of the Muslims are outside with Usama ibn Zayd. Is this real shura? Allah says in the Quran, yes. وَأَمْرُهُمْ shura بَيْنَهُمْ And their matters are a matter of shura. But the khilafah of the Prophet, the one who connects us with Allah, is this an issue of shura? If we all gathered and we chose this person represents God, will that person be a true representative of God? No. Allah tells us in the Quran, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً I am the one who chooses who represents me. Yes. You go and do shura for someone that represents you. Represents yourself amongst yourselves. Go and do shura. But you can't have shura for someone that represents God. Is this person going to have the knowledge? Is this person going to be connected? And this is why Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says a poem. He says that they claim that it was a shura. But what kind of a shura was it when all of those who, are, who should be asked are not there? And they claim that it's about the qurba. The muhajirin, they said, we are the closest to the Prophet. How could it be about the qurba when the closest ones to the Prophet were not there? He says, فَإِن كُنْتَ بِالشُّورَ مَلَكْتَ أُمُورَهُمْ فَكَيْفَ بِهَادَا وَالْمُشِيرُونَ غِيَبُوا If it's about shura, you come and you took power. How is it a shura when there was no real counsel? And if it's about, وَإِن كُنْتَ بِالْقُرْبَى حَجَجْتَ خَصِيمَهُمْ فَغَيْرُكَ أَوْلَى بِالنَّبِيِّ وَأَقْرَبُوا If it's about qurba, the closest to the Prophet, then there are others who are closer to the Prophet, right? Amir al-Mu'mineen was closer to the Prophet. Bani Hashim were closer to the Prophet. So, what kind of a method is this? And this is why this method of Saqifah that you see some today, they defend so much. Even Umar himself, Later on, he says, al saqifa kanat falta. It was a slip. Waqana Allah sharraha. He says the saqifa was a slip. Yeah, it was a disaster. Allah protected us. And then later on, he says, if you see anyone from the Muslims resorting to a type of choosing a leader in a way that's a type of shura, like the one that we had at the saqifa, kill that person. So even he does not acknowledge the saqifa that took place and the shura that took place in that saqifa. This was the leadership. This was the leadership. Now, this is an event. Then, suddenly, Abu Bakr and several of the Muhajireen, several of those men who had given him bay'ah, they go and they begin knocking on the doors of all of the Muslims, telling them, come and give obedience. Come and give allegiance to Abu Bakr, the new Khalifa. Historians mention that a tribe from outside of Medina by the name of Bani Aslam, a tribe of around four to 5,000 men. Suddenly they came marching into Medina carrying their swords and they all gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. This created fear. This caused fear in the hearts of many of those who were in Medina and they felt that they had to give allegiance to Abu Bakr. Now, we know that after Abu Bakr took power, there were wars and there were battles that took place. They are referred to as Hurub al ridda where many of the tribes surrounding Medina they refused to give allegiance to Abu Bakr. Now how is it that this tribe, out of all of the other tribes, suddenly they come marching into Medina with their swords? You could decide what happened. Then they begin calling out people to come and give bay'ah. Now the majority of the Muslims have given bay'ah, except there's a handful of men in the house of Amir al muminin There's a handful that are gathered in the house of Amir al muminin and Fatima. And they are the ones who have not given bay'ah. And most of those, once Bani Aslam came, there's a hadith from Umar, he says, مَا هُوَ إِلَّا أَنْ رَأَيْتْ أَسْلَمْ 
النصر. Umar, he says, once I saw Aslam, the tribe of Aslam come, that's when I knew that we were victorious. Meaning that before Aslam, it was kind of still tricky. But once Aslam came, then I guaranteed that we have the power. The alleys of Medina were filled with men that all came and gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr. So now, we go to the house of Fatima. Was there an attack on the house of Fatima? Go, you don't need to go and read the books of the Shia. All you need to do is look at what the Sunni scholars have said. Over 80 sources from the Sunnis have mentioned that there was an attack, an aggression on the house of Fatima That house that Rasulullah for six months in one hadith, for eight months in one hadith, the last eight months of his life, he used to go and stand at the door of Fatima. And the door of Fatima was visible in front of all of the Muslims in the masjid. He would go and he would say, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ وَلِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرُّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا أَتَأْذَنُونَ لِمُحَمَّدٍ بِالدُّخُولِ Do you give permission for Muhammad to enter? Then Fatima would tell him, Ya Rasulullah, al-baytu baytuk. Oh Rasulullah, this is your home. You don't need to seek permission. Why would Rasulullah seek permission for six months, for eight months? Why would he constantly show this in front of the Muslims, seeking permission? Because Rasulullah wants to show the Muslims. He would stand in front of the door of Fatima and he would say, Babu Fatima Babi. Wa hijabuha hijabi. The door of Fatima is my door and the hijab of Fatima is my hijab. Any aggression on Fatima is an aggression on me. Over 80 Sunni historians say that there was an aggression on the house of Fatima. The only remaining daughter of Rasulullah. Is this the way the Ummah treats Fatima? Even Ibn Taymiyyah, even Ibn Taymiyyah, the man who's filled with animosity towards the Ahlul Bayt, Ibn Taymiyyah, he writes in his book, he writes in his book that they, go, they went into the house of Amir al Ali ibn Abi Talib because there was money that belonged to the Muslims, they went to take it out. Amir al Mu'mineen and Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ahlul Bayt, they have to go, Abu Bakr and Umar and the others, they have to go inside because they have money that belongs to the Muslims. This is the household that's purified by Allah in the Qur'an. Of course, the excuse is sillier than the actual act. You go and you see what historians have written. A man by the name of Ibn Abd Rabbah in his book Al-Abd Al-Farid, Al-Baladri in Ansab Al-Ashraf, he mentions that Abu Bakr was sitting in the masjid of the Prophet. And Al-Baladri and Ibn Abd Rabbah mentioned, they say that Abu Bakr, he says, go and bring Ali and bring those men to give bay'ah. Whatever it takes, go and bring them. So there were several attempts. They sent some men knocking on the door. They refused to open the door. Fatima tells them, leave my door. Leave my door. I am the house. I am the daughter of Rasulullah. And this is the house of Fatima. Several attempts until... Now, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he himself, he goes. And this is Ibn Qutaybah, another Sunni scholar. He says, Umar ibn al-Khattab and several other men, and their names are recorded in history. They go carrying wood to the house of Fatima. Carrying wood to the house of Fatima. And he says, Fatima, let Ali come out. If he does not come out, we will burn your door. We will burn your house. They tell him, Fatima is in the house. What does he say? He says, what in? So what if Fatima is in the house? So what if Fatima is in the house? This is the assault that took place on the family of Rasulullah. And if you want more proof, go and read the wasiyah of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, in his last moments, in his last moments, and when someone is dying, that's the time of truth. That's the time that all of the truth comes out. Abu Bakr, during his last moments, he says, there are three things that I regret. There are three things that I regret doing. One of them, he says, I wish I had not burned Al-Fuja'ah. Al-Fuja'ah was a poet. A man who was a poet, he said a few words of poetry against Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr ordered for him to be burned alive. Al-Fuja'ah. And then he says, second, I wish on the day of Saqifah, I had given the matter to Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah or Umar ibn al-Khattab. I wish they had taken it and I had not taken the Khilafah. And third, he says, Laytani, Laytani, Lam Akshif an Bayti Fatima, wa in Ughlip ala Harb. He says, Only if I had not attacked. Kashf means entered. Only if I had not ordered. 
for the attack on the house of Fatima. And then he says, وَإِنْ أُغْلِقَ عَلَىٰ حَرْبٍ Even if they were willing to fight, what does this mean? This means that Amir al-Mu'mineen and those men that were with him in the house, it was a peaceful opposition. They didn't have swords, they didn't have weapons, they were not fighting. So he says that even if they were fighting, I wish I had not attacked the house. Amir al-Mu'mineen, they were just sitting in the house. <coughs> but they come and they attack the house of the daughter of Rasulullah. The house of Amir al-Mu'mineen. This house that Allah says about it in the Quran, فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَن تُرْفَعَ وَيُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهَ These are the narrations with the Sunni school of thought. Now the Shia narrations, they go a little bit deeper to explain the details and what happened. And they explain that there was a miscarriage that took place. Fatima was pregnant, carrying the grandson of Rasulullah, Al-Muhsin, but there was an attack. And that young Muhsin, the, in the womb of Fatima, as a result of the attack, he lost his life on that day after Fatima was crushed between the door and the wall. Because Fatima was the only opposition. Fatima was the strongest opposition. And they saw that the only way to silence the opposition is to crush her between the door and the wall. This is what they order. Sulaim ibn Qais, one of the companions of the Prophet, he mentions in details what happens. He says they came and they brought the fire next to the door of Fatima. And Fatima, she begins to tell them, leave my home. I do not give you permission to enter. Now some ask, why was Fatima by the door? Why didn't Amir al-Mu'mineen come by the door? Because Fatima alayhi salam wanted to protect the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. They were after Amir al-Mu'mineen, so she wanted to come and save the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. She wanted to see that if they respect Fatima, they might not transgress and attack her house for the sake of Fatima if they have no respect for Amir al-Mu'mineen. They say that they came and they pushed the door open. As the man pushed the door open, he placed his back on the wall and he placed his feet on the doors and he began to kick the door. And Fatima, she stood between the door and the wall for the sake of hijab so that they don't see her. She went behind the door and a nail from that door, a nail from the door entered into the ribs of Fatima breaking the ribs of Fatima alayhi salam she began to go through a miscarriage she began to have a miscarriage what does she say she says ya fitla tu adrakini oh fitla come and help me why didn't she call Amir al-Mu'mineen because Amir al-Mu'mineen was taken out of the house she called Fitla. Fitla comes to her. Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein, they're sitting there watching. They don't know whether they should follow their father, Amir al Mu'mineen, or they should protect their mother, Fatima. Many years later, Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam, he sees Al Mughirah ibn Shu'bah, and this is narrated in Al Ihtijaj by Al Tabrasi. Imam al Hassan, he tells Al Mughirah, Oh Mughirah, I saw you slap my mother, Fatima. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I saw you slap my mother Fatima <laughs> until she had a miscarriage and she lost her son Muhsin. <laughs> this is not the end, my dear brothers and sisters. Fatima is in the house. She's going through labor. She's having a miscarriage. Amir al-Mu'mineen is taken out of the house. So Fatima, she gathers herself and she stands and she goes into the masjid to protect the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. She stands in the masjid and she sees them holding Amir al-Mu'mineen trying to force him to give bay'ah. She goes and she stands there and she calls out, Let go of Ali ibn Abi Talib because I will ask Allah to punish you and the she Kamal of Salih is not more worthy in the eyes of Allah than I am. Allah punished the people of Salih because they killed the camel. You think that Allah will not accept my dua? Salman, 
He asks Fatima, he tells her, Oh Fatima, don't do dua against this ummah. Your father was sent as a mercy to mankind. She tells him, Oh Salman, don't you see that they're trying to make my sons orphans? They're trying to orphan Hassan and Hussein. One of the narrators, Sulaim, he goes and he asks Salman, he tells him, O oh Salman, is it true that they attacked the house of Fatima? Is it true that they assaulted the house of Amir al muminin and Fatima? Salman, he answers him, the poet, he has it in a poetry. He says, Qala Sulaiman qultu ya Salmanu Hal dakhalu wa lam yakustidhanu Sulaim asks Salman, he tells him, O oh Salman, is it true that they entered the house of Fatima without seeking permission? وراء الباب رعاية للستر والحجاب He says, yes, O Salman, it is true that they assaulted the house of Fatima. Uh, by the Lord, I swear to you that they did so. And I will tell you something else. For the sake of hijab, Fatima went behind the door to protect her modesty and chastity. فَمُدْرَأَوْهَا عَصَرُوهَا عَصْرَ كَادَتْ بِنَفْسِ أَن تَمُوتْ حَصْرَ when they felt her between the wall and the door, they pushed on the door until she was crushed in between the door and the wall. <laughs> what did she do? Tasihu ya fiddat wa asnidini faqad wa rabbi asqatu janini She called out, O oh, Fiddha, come and help me. I swear by Allah, they have made me miscarry my son. فَأَسْقَطَتْ بِنْتُ الْهُدَى وَحَزَنَا جَنِينَهَا ذَاكَ الْمُسَمَّى مُحْسِنَا She lost her janeen. She lost that baby in her womb. That baby that Rasulullah named Muhsin. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون والعاقبة للمتقين If people really respected Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, would they come few days after his death to the house of his daughter, Fatima sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and threaten to burn it down? I mean, leave everything alone. Leave religion aside here. If a person comes and saves another person, person was about to die, drown, he actually saves him. How would you pay back this individual? Fatima al-Zahra says, Don't you hear Rasulullah stating that you respect an individual by respecting his progeny, his children. That's how you respect him. Take care of his children. How did you guys take care of me? What did you guys do? Nine people, nine people were ordered to come and attack the house of Fatima led by a person. He came. He shouted from behind the door. Get out or I will burn this house. They told him inside the house is Fatima. Inna fiddari Fatima. Qala wa in. Fatima is inside the house. He said, so what? We will threaten to burn the house down. And so Fatima, salamullahi alayha, stood behind the door of her house. And that's when the individual then attacked the door. Now even the Quran tells us that do not enter the houses until you seek permission for entrance. And this is not an ordinary house. This is the house of Nubuwa. And he attacked that house. 
Then Fatima Salamullah alayha fell behind the door. As Zubair came out of the house carrying his sword, but the sword fell from him. So when the sword fell, they captured him. Then Amir al Mu'mineen came out of the house and then they gathered around him and they put the ropes around his hands and they took him to the masjid. And right there, watching and observing everything is Imam Hassan Salamullah Alayh and Imam Al Hussein Alayhi Salam and Zainab and Um Kulthum. They're watching the whole thing right there. These little children of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alayhi Wa Alihi Wasallam are seeing their mother Fatima. The lady whom Rasulullah used to kiss her hand every time he would come and visit her. Now she's behind the door in the state and she fell down. Sheikh Abdul Zahra Al Ka'bi, may Allah bless his soul, a Sheikh who died about 30 years ago or so. He used to recite in Karbala in the Haram of Imam Hussein. He says, One night in the dream, I saw Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. And Imam Hussein told me, A Sheikh, why don't you read our musibah? I told him, Sayyidi Ibn Rasulullah, every time when I go in the haram, I recite your musibah, your tragedy. You and Imam al Hassan, salam Allah alayhim, both of you. He said, Ya Shaykh, that is not really our musibah. He said, What is your musibah then, Sayyidi? And I will recite it. He said, Ya Shaykh, on the day when they attacked the door, our mother Fatima, salam Allah alayha, fell behind the door. My brother Hassan and I, we were looking at her and we didn't know what to do. Shall we stay with our mother Fatima or shall we run after our father Ali ibn Abi Talib who was being dragged in the streets of Medina? People were all in a shock. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the hero of Khaybar. This is the hero of Uhud and Hunayn. Now they have ropes around his hands and they are dragging him to the masjid. Is this Ali ibn Abi Talib? Then she woke up, she got up and she said, Zainab, Bunayya, Aina Abuki, where is your father? She said, Ummah, they have taken him outside. She said, come with me. Then she took Hassan on one side and Hussein on one side. She went after Amir al Mu'mineen, calling Khallu ibn Ammi awla akshif lad dua ra'si. Leave my cousin alone or I will make dua against you people. Amir al Mu'mineen turned to Salman. He said, Ya Salman, go tell Fatima not to make a dua because if she makes a dua, Allah will perish all these people. Salman came back to her. He said, Ya Fatima, inna abaki bu'itha rahmah, fala takuni ala haula innas niqma. Fatima, your father has been sent as a mercy to the people. Don't be a curse against them. She said, Am, they have taken my right away from me and I have been patient. Am, they've just killed my baby and I've been patient. But now they want to make my children orphan. I will not let them do so. So leave my cousin alone. When people saw this, the second man then ordered his servant to come back to Fatima Salamullah alayha. And he started hitting her with the end of his sword. People were all calling, this is Fatima Hadihi bin to Muhammad. This is the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. How could people forget? That's why in her sermon, she stated in one of the parts, Ayyuhan Nayas, I'lamu anni Fatima wa Abi Muhammad. Oh people be aware that I am Fatima and my father is Muhammad. I'm saying it repeatedly and you people know it is the truth. And then she went to the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And she would shed her tears calling, Ah, 
وامصرنا لياليم then they let Amir al-Mu'mineen come back they let him go he came to her he said Ya Fatima how are you she said if you are fine then I am fine as well he said Ya Fatima do you hear the call of the Adhan she said yes Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen he said if you want to continue hearing the call of the Adhan then we have to be patient Ya Fatima she said, okay, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. And indeed, indeed, she kept her patience. And that's why when she left this dunya, Amir al Mu'mineen went to the grave of Rasulullah. Qala, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, the trust has come back, and your weak daughter, the one who has been weakened through the pain and the suffering, she is gone and she has joined you, Ya Rasulullah. Ah, ah, inna lillah. Mina we seen. اگر یا زهرا کار داریم همه با زهرا می نویسیم اگر یا زهرا کار داریم همه با زهرا می نویسیم هزاران دفعه فاطمه فاطمه زهرا نصف او را از سر ناچاری می نویسی و الا زهرا فاطمه بود سراپا احمد مصطفی بود سراپا زهرا هر کسی را که ز نسلش دیدیم هر کسی را که ز نسلش دیدیم حرمی داشته الا زهرا ناهلت الجسم یعنی نهیف و دل شکسته میری جوونی اما مادر پیری بهونه یه سفر میگیری با کیه تلا یعنی بارون غصه ها میباره چشای مادر ما تاره دیگه علی شده بیچاره منهده تر راکن یعنی توون براد نمونده بانو که قلب تو سوزونده با نو کی بال تو شکونده با نو معصبتر رس یعنی بستی سری رو که پر درده رنگ رو خیتو مادر زرده تو کوچه کی جسارت کرد شبای فاطمیه از غربت صورتم سینم که بود مثل صورت سینه می زنم برا مصیبت 
شب روزت شب مراج منه همین لبالا شب روزت شب مراج منه جبرائیل به سینه و سر میزنه اومدنی دیدی بانیه روز حسین و حسنه بانیه روز حسین و همه بخونن ای مادر کرم بی 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 حرم ای مادر کرم بی 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 خودم دیدم که شب ها سخت می خوابی واسه رفتم بمیرم خیلی بیتابی امون ای دل امون خودم دیدم شده چشمای تو کم سو نگم دیگه از این پهلو به اون پهلو امون ای دل نرو زهرا نرو آرامش هیده نرو زهرا نرو آرامش نرو زهرا نرو اگه میشه نرو ای تکیه گاه یاری چوز تو نیست توی سپاه من ببین کسی رو ندارم ببین علی تنها شده اگه میشه نرو این تکیه گاه من که یاری جوز تو نیست توی سپاه من نرو زهرا نرو بمیرم من دل از غم شکستت رو بمیرم من نمازای نشستت همون ای دلم 
شما مثل علی کنار بستر زهرا التماس کنید نرو زهرا نرو آرامش حیدر نرو زهرا نرو آرامش حیدر نرو زهرا بند آخر نمیدونیم زنده میمونیم بازم برات گریه کنیم یا نه به هم میگیم چرا از شهر دل گیرم به هم میگیم چرا از شهر دل گیرم چرا سلام میدم جوابم رو نمیگیرم نرو زهرا نرو سکوت تو برای من چقدر سخته زهرا بدون تو علی بودن چقدر سخته اینجا باید این حرف رو زد صحیح بخاری از صحه کتب اهل سنت جملش اینه و کامل لعلی من الناس وجهن حیات فاطمه تا زهرا زنده بود علی بین مردم آب روی داشت فلما توفیت استم کر علی و وجوه الناس وقتی از دنیا رفت علی دیگه خانه نشید <تصفيق> برای من چقدر سخته بدون تو علی بودم چقدر سخته نرو زهرا نرو بار آخرم بگو التماس کن نرو زهرا نرو آرامش هیده نرو زهر نرو زهر نرو آرامش
چون دل ای وای مادر وای مادر وای مادر وای مادر ای وای بر واقع چه بود وای مادر مادر بنگر که حسن با چشم گریان دم گرفته چی میخونه ما مثلا در خواب گوید مادر کجایی راهی نمانده تا خانه بیاید شب دیدم تا بخواهی روی پهلو بازگردی با هر لرزش آه ناله کردی ناله کردی ناله کردی مادر دیدم که بابا دور از گل رود با دست لرزان شد سرگرم تا بود داره حق گمیشه تو دود آتیش فتن گران تا زروزه در شده اول درد سران پر آتیش کوچه رسیده به بال و پران آی کسی نیست این دور بران فاطمه میگیره حق همسر شد فاطمه تنها نمیذاره رهبر شد آتیشم گریونه وقتی میسوزونه چادر شد هدیه به خدا میده قنچه پرفر شد خدا میخر قربت محسن و مادر شد شهیدای حیدر شد خون گریون دریا زهر Yeah, you. 
بود دریا زهرا عشق مجنون لیلا زهرا شد اول درد سرا هر آتیش کوچ رسید به بال و پرا کسی نیستی دور و برا دو خدا جز دیدن چیزی نمیخوام برگرد عزیزم که خیلی تنها یه ماشکی میگم به تو که بود پا که بود پا نبودی روزی صد دفعه مردم بابا مردم بابا مردم امو میدید که من زمین خوردم بابا مردم همه بخونیم نبودی روزی صد دفعه مردم بابا مردم بابا مردم امو میدید که من زمین خوردم بابا مردم بابا مردم نگم برات از غروب کربلا نگم برات از نگاه شامی و سه سالمه بزا سر وسته بگم نگم برات از نگاه بیان شکایتم از این اتفاق یه شب که افتادم زمین از روی ناغ تموم نمیشه درد سر من گوشم هنوز از بعد سیلی داغ داغ خدا رو من خیلی صدا کردم صدا کردم صدا کردم خدا رو من خیلی صدا صدا کردم برا سلامتی دعا کردم دعا کردم دعا کردم نگم برات گریه منو ندید نگم برات چه جوری مومو کشید نگم برات حرف بد به میزد همونی که س... همونی که سر و از تنه بری نبود 
شدی روزی صد دفعه مردم بابا مردم بابا مردم امو میدید که من زمین سمت مسجد رونه آتیش گرفته تموم خونه مادر گرفته دامان مولا پیچید دستش به تازیون ویلی از زهرا مغلومم ویلی از زهرا مغلومم ویلی از زهرا مغلومم ویلی از زهرا میون باقچه دلا بارون نم لمزنه همسایمون در خونشون باز داره پرچم میزنه این صدای چاووشه میگه ببین کشش گوشه برای مادر ارباب داره مشکی میپوشه روز خونی شد تو ایونا با کربلایی ها با مهمونا زبون میگیرن آسمونا روز خونی شد تو ایونا با کربلایی ها با مهمونا زبون میگیرن آسمونا ویلی از زهرا مدلومم ویلی از زهرا مدلومم ویلی از زهرا مدلومم ویلی از زهرا در و دیوار حیطا کتیب های قم خواهد به خدا فاطمی یه دونه محتشم خواهد در و دیوار حیطا کتیب های قم خواهد به خدا فاطمی هم یه دون محتشم میخواد مثل محرم تمومه خیابونا علم میخواد آتیش میگیرد هی دریا میخوان بمیرن ما دریا وقتی میخونن آزریا یارالی ننه یارالی ننه یارالی ننه یارالی ننه یارالی ننه یارالی ننه ویلی از زهرا مغلومت ویلی از زهرا مغلومت ویلی از زهرا مغلومت ویلی از زهرا مادر بیتابمونو میگن صدای گریه هاش 
به هم زده خوابمونو چند روز بابا ندیده روی آفتابمونو این تأثیر آتیشه کار پهلوی زخمیشه را که میره نفساش یکی در میون میش داره میخونه باد سبا با گریه زاری تو این شبا مثل امیر تشن لبا امی از زهرا مظلوم امی از زهرا مظلوم قاتلك فاطمة لا عن الله قاتلك فاطمة لا عن الله قاتلك فاطمة لا الله <تصفيق> الله يلعنهم لعن عادل ثم لعنة السبت على من خان العهود لعنة السبت على من في الحشر ما تقول مغفرة لعن الله قاتل فاطمة لعن الله قاتل لعن الله قاتل صوت حرق باب الرسول هلا هلا الله يلعن من حرق باب الرسول الله يلعن من كسر ضلع البتول الله يلعن الله يلعن من كسر الله يلعن كل من يقلهم قبول الله يلعن كل من يقلهم قبول ولي خاف كلمة الحق ما يقول ولي خاف يوم المحكمة للنبي شيقول يوم لا عن الله قاتلك فاطمة إيه لا عن الله قاتلك فاطمة إيه لا عن الله قاتلك فاطمة انتم لا دستی که بسته بود میشست بی صدا دستی که خسته بود در زیر نور ما گل برگ گل کبود گل ها فسرده بود جرم علی چه بود روی عدو سیاه Yo
فاطمه یا فاطمه یا فاطمه یا فاطمه یا فاطمه آتش زدی به جانم بانوی بینشانه بانوی بینشانه بانوی بینشانه گفتی مرا کفن کن مظلوم من شبانه مظلوم من شبانه مظلوم من شبانه آه سردار بدر و خیبر دیگر ز پا فتاده دستی به دوش سلمان دستی به سر نهاده یا فاطمه یا فاطمه یا فاطمه یا فاطمه یا فاطمه یا فاطمه یا ابن الحسن کمک کن جد متحرت را جد متحرت را جد متحرت را بیرون به برز خانه تابوت مادرت را تابوت مادرت را تابوت مادرت را روزی تو خواهی آمد از غربت زمانه می آوری نشانه آن قبر بی نشانه یا فاطمه 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 یا فاطمه